Welcome back to another episode of the Sales Gravy Podcast. With me is Alexander Zakharin, who is a real estate agent and guru located in New York City. We're going to be talking about the impact of the changing economy and volatility on real estate and what real estate agents should be doing right now in order to shore up their businesses. But first, I want you to go check out Sales Gravy University. Sales Gravy University is where sales professionals from across the globe and their companies come to learn. At Sales Gravy University, we have reinvented sales training. You can take online courses that are delivered live from our master trainers or on-demand courses that you can take anywhere, anytime, on any device. And right now, you can take your very first course for free when you use the coupon code free course. Just go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com. Use the coupon code free course. You can take any course you want. And Alexander, let's get started. Let's do it. Tell us about you. Uh, well, uh, my name is Alexander, and uh, I'm originally from Russia. Uh, I was in the U.S. before moving here for many times, and then at some moment I realized that I have to be here. So I, I came to New York for the sake of New York. I didn't have any job offer. I didn't have any plan or contingency plan. There was nothing. I loved New York. I loved high skyscrapers. That's pretty much my story. The reason I came here. And I ended up in real estate by pure accident. Uh, a friend of mine recommended me to uh, get in touch with one person who worked in real estate. And he said essentially that she seems to be as crazy as you are coming to New York without any plan. And you guys should meet. And we, we did meet. And, you know, I, I asked her what you do. She said, I, I rent apartments. She wasn't even selling. I'm renting apartments in Manhattan. And I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. And she's like, you want to try that? I'm like, sure. Can I get an interview? And that's what we did. And I got hired by, back then the company was called GGB Realty. Now it's Saving News Real Estate. And that's how, that's how it started about five years ago. So about five years ago, with, with no plan whatsoever, you decide that you have to be in America. And in particular, you have to be in New York City. That's right. Like this, this is your place. So, then, so you show up without a job. Yes. And then you, and then you stumble into real estate. Yes, exactly like this. So I was in sales before, but I never sold real estate in my life. I was in oil and gas for a few years before coming to the U.S. You know, and I mean, I did have sales experience. That's pretty much my life, but I never sold real estate. My first real estate transaction, if you want to call it, was renting my apartment back in St. Petersburg in Russia one day before I left Russia. <laughs> so, that's it. Very good. I love those stories. I, th I think it's, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, the bull just go do and they just figure it out. Like one of my favorite sayings is that messy success is better than perfect mediocrity. And I, I came across this quote of yours in your book, Phonetical Prospecting. I think you, you also talked about um, basically you would rather if something is worse to be to be done, it can be done poorly. I think that's like how yes. you put it. Right? I love it. Messy success. That's exactly what real estate in New York is about. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's the, one of the, well, the traits of ultra performers is just, they just take action and they, they, you, you know, if you bounce off something that doesn't work, you just change it really quickly, but you just keep taking action. And, and the, it, it is, it's bold action, but, but people who, you have all these regrets that are left over because they just didn't do anything. They're the ones that want everything to be perfect before they take any action and they live a life of mediocrity. I mean, you can imagine that if you'd said, well, I'm going to get every duck in the row, everything's going to be perfect. You got to have a job. You got to have everything set up before I leave Russia and come to America. You'd probably still be there. So, you know, what a, you know, what a, what a great message to people. Like if you got a dream, sometimes you just got to go do it. So let's just talk about real estate. So you're selling oil and gas, you get into real estate and you fall in love with it. Why? So I love Manhattan. Like there was almost, not almost, was love at first sight. I remember my first city in, in the US when I arrived here was actually Chicago. And then I, I, I took one of those uh, Greyhound bus, bus, I think the, the service, like the bus that travels between the cities. And they arrived in New York and I remember the guy next to me, he was like, welcome to the best city on earth. And I was like, wow. And you know, we, we ended up in Midtown West. You see skyscrapers, all those beautiful buildings that I would later rent and sell as well. And I was like, this is the place. But you won't believe it, Jeff. It, it took me another nine years to actually move to the US. Wow. Nine years. 
Yeah, I, I changed my, my 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 place a few times. You know, I graduated from high school in Russia. I moved to the UK, did my you know uh, college time and first jobs and everything. Then I moved back to Russia, and then I moved eventually to the US. So I love New York. I love skyscrapers. I like that and. I was asking everyone, like, what do you do in New York? If you move to New York, what, what's the thing to do? Because, like, if you're in Russia, you try to do, you know, oil and gas back back, back when I was there. And I'm like, they say, well, okay, you know, you could try real estate. New York is all about real estate. And uh, that was uh, that was how it started. So what is it about real estate that, uh, that you dig so much that you love? So I was, so the way I was thinking about it, I was like, what do I hate first and foremost at my previous job, right? And, you know, those are corporate work. Uh, we work basically with, we call it ceiling. You would have a ceiling, you know, you wouldn't be commission based. You would get bonus sometimes, but it's subjective because it's not the market that assesses you. It's, it's someone else that assesses you. Right. And so the, the other challenge was also, I mean, in Russia, we call it uh, golden cage. In the US, I think it's called golden handcuffs. Yes. Where, right, like where you have your salary and stability, but at the same time, there's no way to grow the way you would love to grow. You kind of kid, you kind of kidnapped by your job. So I didn't like that. And I really appreciated in real estate in New York that, uh, you know, the earning potential is high. You're your own boss in terms of, I mean, probably your market is your boss, but you could influence that way better than anyone else, right? And it's it's also high, uh, highly competitive. I love competition because it keeps me going. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much that. And also everybody is moving to New York, not only in New York. I know, I mean, Atlanta is amazing. I was in Atlanta two years ago. I, I, I love it. Georgia, beautiful, you know, state and cities, but like New York is... It's just amazing. And people from all over come here. In one day, you're already New Yorker. No one would ever say, you know, I came from this country or from this country. Like, I'm a New Yorker. You've been here for one day. Sure. <laughs> Mingled it. You be careful when you start talking about Georgia because that's where I'm from, right? So, I'm, you know, Atlanta's my hometown and I, I, I'm a big, I love Georgia. So, <laughs> and you, you know that uh, you have, what do you call it, Jeff, in Atlanta? Um, uh, the, this the belt or like where people go like tourists and everyone there's like a long uh, sightseeing place um everybody walks there and you have all the cool places around you know I, what it, i mean but the I, centurio uh, cent, i think it's what is it it's the park downtown i think what you're talking park, about but it's like a long way there's like a few miles everybody walks there there isn't there's like some name for it but basically it's the same developer that built highline oh. In New York. Oh, I think I, I think it's um I, I know what you're talking about. I, I, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. I don't I, I I see I'm not a tourist in my own city, so I don't know. I know I know, you know. the same here in New York. I don't know any like yeah. even this kind of now, but the point is that New York is borrowing some stuff from Atlanta. There you go. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, there, there there truly is no place in the world like New York. It's a it's a it's a great city. I'm happy to visit it. Um, I, I like the country, uh, but the, uh, but there is, um, you know, you are right. You know, New York is real estate. Like it is, it's all about real estate. And, and if you can, and as I say, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Uh, do, do you know who Babe Ruth is? Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. Okay. I'm going to teach you something. Okay. So, uh -huh. you know, who the New York Yankees are. Yeah. So okay. Right. So so Babe Ruth um, was a baseball player back in the I believe the 1930s. Don't don't put in something in the comments and tell me I got this wrong. But I think back in the 1930s. But he was a prolific home run hitter and one of the most famous home run hitters in baseball ever. And he was famous. Now this could be a myth. It could be true. Who knows? But he was famous for he would get up to the plate and then he would take the bat and he would point into the stands where he was going to hit the ball. And, th and, and it was good at exactly that. Yeah. And that's how I see sales, right? I see yeah. real estate and I see all of sales. That's the way I fell in love with sales is that I can get up to the plate and I make the decision where I'm going to hit the ball. So it puts me in charge of my life. It puts me in charge of my oh. income and whether you're in real estate or whether you have a sales job with another company, essentially you are an entrepreneur. If you get a sales job with another company, you're an entrepreneur without all the risk, but True. you control your own destiny, which is why I, I yeah. love, I love sales so much. And I think in real estate, even, even more, you, 
you you have like you said you've you have so much freedom to decide what you're going to be definitely and i also before coming to the us uh, my english teacher told me that people in the united states they use a lot of sport analogy in the language and the expression swing for defenses yeah. I, I just love it. I never used it in my life before I came to New York, actually. Uh, but yeah, when, whenever we hire new agents, new real estate agents, we always say that you're a self-employed person. You're your own company. Don't treat this job as, you know, you come to work for someone. You're working for yourself. You're self-employed. You're an entity. And th that's where the mentality should come from. Yeah, it really does begin with, you know, with that level of mindset that I'm an entrepreneur, I work for myself, and I, it's up to me to make it happen. And right. if, if, if you look at the world that way, then you'll, you know, you, then you start taking the actions that are required to be good yeah. at what you do. Now, the, the fun thing about my job is that and although I don't specialize in real estate because I'm, I'm a B2B sales trainer, I get pulled into real estate all the time. So I, I usually am standing in front of really large groups of real estate agents and companies ask me to come in and talk about fanatical prospecting. I just got back from Australia. I spent two days with 400 real estate agents doing wow. nothing but fanatical prospecting and, and of course selling in a crisis because they're having the same issues there that we are here. And uh, right before that, I was in Boston. I had, I think 1200 Keller Williams agents all in, uh, all in a ballroom in Boston talking to them wow. about prospecting and uh, and the issues that are impacting the marketplace right now. So let's um let let's let's step back for a second cuz I think your perspective is is uh, is a good one. I'd come over here, I'd get into real estate. I was an oil and gas salesperson in another country. I got an English teacher who taught me that Americans in the American uh, lexicon, we use a lot of sports lingo, which is true. And yeah. there's there's tons of sports analogies. So I love it. So let's talk about um, what it takes to be great in real estate in any market in any city. Like, what have you learned about the basics and fundamentals of excellence in your space? Uh, I think number one thing, and you actually m mentioned it in your book as well, uh, it's uh, people uh, like networks and communities because we all value the same thing at the end of the day, right? And so I think regardless which business you're in, especially if it's a service business, consulting, educational business, real estate sales, anything, software sales as well. Uh, I think that it starts with people and you basically connect with people while different, I mean, everybody is different. Everybody uses different tools and means and everybody has different, you know, mentality, but like at the end of the day, it's all about people. So I, I noticed that like whenever we have new agents coming to work and even in our company, uh, it's, it's whoever makes the deals faster in the beginning, they somehow focus on human aspect more than like anything else. You would always have a guy who is, you know, filling out Excel spreadsheets or a guy who is like, yeah, how do we approach? What's my style? Should I be more personal? Should I be friendly or should I be tough? Giving tough love to people, you know? And then there was always a guy who is like, you know, calling maybe not exactly on your level, not a fanatical prospecting level, but like he'll call someone is like, oh, by the way, I'm doing real estate now. If you ever need anything, you know, like reach out to me. Always someone who's like more personal, per personable, I think that's the word. And these guys tend to succeed faster than the rest. So I think like the human side, it's first and foremost, regardless which, which business or country or, you know, anything else. So would it be fair to say that, uh, that the first key to being excellent in real estate is just talking with people. I think so. Yeah, the more people you talk with, the more real estate you'll list, the more real estate you'll sell, the more real estate you'll rent, the more Pretty people much. you talk with. So it's really about talking with people. And by the way, I, th I think that's, I think that's a, a powerful message for salespeople everywhere is uh -huh. it's mostly about talking with people. I see the same thing. Salespeople are in the office working on spreadsheets, planning to plan to plan to plan to plan to plan to maybe have a conversation. And then there's, you know, there's a, there's another sales rep that comes in and just starts having conversations and they're not always very good conversations, but they're yeah. talking. And by having conversations, they start to learn. Like people tell them, here's what you shouldn't say. Here's what you should say. Here's what you should ask. Here's what's important. And, yeah. and you begin like shaping the way that you talk and you get, you get better a lot faster when you're engaging in conversations and building out your network. Definitely. Um, I also think that, you know, like I spend way too much time at school, so I think it's good. But also I think that sometimes you overlearn 
And there's a lot of things like they contradict each other, right? So you only learn it by doing. And for instance, we just discussed it yesterday in the company, the team meeting, say you have three hours available in the morning before anything else. So one person can spend three hours studying theory and market and, and names and everything else. And the other person will spend one hour doing that plus the other two hours actually applying. And at yes. the end of the day, long term, the first person, I mean, because he can't really use the knowledge that he just gained from research, it will fade away while the second person would most likely, you know, land onto something solid. So. Yeah. There's, there's just no substitute for doing when I bring a new salesperson on, they'll, I'll drop them on the phone. Just, I want you to call these 25 people and they'll say, what do I say? And what do I yeah. do if they say, and I said, I don't know, we're going to find out, just go have a conversation because I if I tell them what to say, or I tell them what to do when someone says something, they won't get it or understand it. But if they go yeah. out and experiment and then they come back and say, okay, I had these conversations. This is what people asked. I didn't have an answer for it. What do I do? Now, right. now they've got the information in the context of reality of the real world. And it's a lot right. easier to teach that way, but you got to find people who are just, you got to be willing to put yourself out there and have those conversations. I can't emphasize this enough. The more people you talk with, the wealthier you're going to be. It's all about the conversations. I, I love it. I think you also mentioned in one of your books that like sales, it's a contact sport. Like you need yeah. to have more contacts, right? So the more people you contact with, the more people you sell to. So I think this is number one, like the top priority. Okay. So what else, what else do modern real estate professionals need to be doing in order to be successful? Like what are the, like the going back to those basics and fundamentals? Right. I think uh, usually people call it to be resilient to stress, right? I, I, I see it more like heavier energy that like protects you against the stress. So it's almost the same, but the way I see it is like, you have your own things that give you energy. Like I like running for instance, right? So I, I, I run in the morning and that gives me energy. It's also hard, especially like in New York, it's super rainy and cold today. So we did the first thing in the morning. So I'm done with this. For me, that was like the hardest thing. And I don't have to ruminate about it anymore because I was tempted in the morning, like not to do it and do it later in the evening after our podcast. But I was like, if I, I do it first thing in the morning, so I don't have to ruminate about it. I have my energy and my brain is not about it anymore. Right. So then I can tackle anything else. So I think like this thing of, cause everybody has their energy coming from different sources, but like whenever you able to get this energy and use it against the stress, that's, that's when you actually become invincible in sales, or at least you manage to last longer. Yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. And I think that's true for, for all salespeople is when you, th when you think about selling as a profession, it takes a great deal of mental energy and mental mm -hmm. resilience because most of the time we're not having victories. Most of the time we're having failures and yeah. it's also, you got to think and you got to think on your feet and it can be stressful and, and, and anxiety inducing and, but it's your ability to outthink and outwit that gives you a competitive advantage, but your mental resiliency is limited by your physical resiliency. So you've got to find a way to keep yourself physically fit so that you can be mentally fit. And you also have got to find a way to, 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 to drop things back in that give you energy. So for example, for me, reading gives me energy. And when I'm in my car, when I'm listening to, to podcasts or audiobooks or things that, that fill me up, those things are part of restoring me and getting me excited about my day. In a lot of cases, I'm not reading anything that has anything to do with sales. I might be reading business books, but, but putting positive things in. And, uh, and, and for me, it's staying away from the news. It's staying away from uh, any negativity. It's, putting, it's, it's getting myself in places where I'm lifting myself up versus allowing outside forces to push me down. It's like what you, one of your chapters in Selling in Crisis uh, deals with like, like how you approach your day, like during the crisis, yes. how you start your day, what you listen to, how you call, how you interact. And I really love this point that you just mentioned as well, where like in the book you say that like all the negative news, like instead of listening to those, why wouldn't you just either listen to a better podcast or the book, more like something like timeless and that has less to do with the chaos that's happening right now, because 
and there are more advantages of listening to something positive or at least something not related to the state of affairs, right? This is this is amazing. Yeah, and I think, you know, the it's it's tempting to to get caught up in that. Last night I I flew in late to Atlanta uh, from Philadelphia and I didn't get home till midnight and I got a 2 hour drive from from Atlanta to my house. And I, uh, I, I got, you know, got in my car and I, and I took off and I, you know, I put on the radio and I'm like, I want to listen to the, I mean, you know, my brain goes, I'm going to listen to the news. It's easy. There's people talking. It keeps me occupied. And, and then I thought, well, I'm gonna listen to a podcast. And I went, no, you know, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I've been training all day long. I had, it was a long day and I've had a long week. And so I, I put, I hooked my phone up to my car and I have a, a list of Christmas carols and I put Christmas carols on. And for two hours I sung and I sing badly, like I'm terrible, but I was singing at the top of my lungs all the way home, all my favorite Christmas carols. And when I got home, I felt great. And I was dragging when I left. So it, it's finding yeah. things that, that lift you up. It's, and it's so easy, like you said, to go, you know, it's raining outside. I'm not going to do that. It's so easy to say, I'm bored yeah. with driving two hours. I'm just going to listen to a bunch of things that are, that are, you know, that are more fun to listen to than, than, you know, than, you know, music or a podcast or what have you, but you have to be disciplined to take care of yourself, take care of your mind, take care of your heart, take care of your um, your physical well-being. Definitely. Because, I mean, someone told me recently, like, you can't give the world more than you have for yourself. So whenever it starts from your own energy and your own uh, mental agility, you know, if this is a priority, then you're able to give more and sell more and then help to more people. So That's a really good point. Okay, yeah. what else do real estate agents need to be doing um, in the, you know, from a basic and fundamental standpoint to, to be at the top of their game? So I think following, uh, following routine, following the agenda that they set for themselves, this is probably like, if we talk about concrete things, like tangible things, this is number one advice. Uh, so I really like the idea of having golden hours. Um, in fanatical perspective, you talk about a lot about that when you have your calls and your time of interacting with people, right? Looking for new business. Uh, this is your golden hours you protect with, with your life, right? I noticed that. So I, when I started um, my first couple of years, I was solely doing like rental business. I mean, I was trying to get, you know, buyers and get into the buyer's game. But like, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning in New York, especially in Manhattan, because you need faster cash flow as a new agent, you always start with rentals, right? And then if you're disciplined, if you're lucky at some point, if you find a way, you can always land on your first buyer or seller, and then you can leverage on that. So, but like in the beginning, I wasn't doing calls. I wasn't uh, fanatically prospecting the way it should be done. So once I implemented that in my system, so every day from Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., 10, two hours, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., that's when I do calls and like follow-ups. So once I implemented this principle, I think my business just skyrocketed. Like, and I'm not even leveraging on it full time because everything is in my CRM. Like, you know, if I go there now, there are tons of things that I, you know, still should do today, you know? So following that and like protecting your routine. And then before that, it's nice to find something that gives you peace of mind and energy. Like you said, you know, maybe singing Christmas carols or, or running or listening to something else. So always having a routine because, you know, like real estate in New York, if you go to your office, there's, on one hand, you don't have an agenda. Like there is no one, there's no one who can tell you. I mean, you have a team leader who can help you with, with their experience, of course, but like you kind of sit next to your computer, you know, at your desk and like, all right, what do we do next? So as an agent, you have to come up with something you'll follow every single day and you should understand. I mean, of course, there's a chaos and clients calling and sellers and buyers and landlords and approvals the stuff that you call important, right? Uh, but you also have the stuff that it's impactful, right? I really like this idea of you, Jeff. I rewatched re one of your videos on Instagram about that. There's a lot of important stuff. There's a lot of trivial stuff. People in real estate rarely talk about impactful stuff, but the impactful, it's, the, it's something that you should start your day with. So I, a couple of things you said there, are, I think are, are critical to, to, to point out. No matter where you go on earth, no matter what industry you're in, when you meet top sales professionals at the top of their game, 
they all have a routine. Using a sports analogy, no matter where you go, anywhere in the world, when you meet elite professional athletes, they all have a routine. Whether it's a practice routine, whether it's a game routine, they have a routine, they stick to the routine. The problem is, is that routines are boring, but boring works. So, yes. so you've got to have that routine with your day because like you said, most sales days are unstructured. So if you don't have a routine, it's really easy because of the way the human brain works and because we're fallible people to drift off into things that have are either trivial or, you know, maybe important, but they make no impact. And impact for sales professionals is putting things into the pipeline and moving things through the pipeline to get them sold. So you begin with the routine and the routine should be focused on your golden hours, which is the time during the day that you can interact with buyers, in your case, buyers and sellers and buyers and renters and buyers and landlords, but you can interact with people. You can have conversations with people. You said something earlier that I want to bring into this, and that is you got to you got to eat a few frogs along the way as well. So you said, you know, this morning you got up, it's raining outside, it's foggy, it's cold, it's nasty. And the last thing you want to do is suit up and go out and run in this mess. Yeah. So your brain says, Alexander, we could do this later. Let's do the podcast with Jeb and then we'll go out there and it'll be yeah, all right. It'll be a, it'll yeah. Be like doing it maybe. yeah. But you know, and I know that if you push off something that you don't want to do, you're probably not going to do it. And the same thing goes with prospecting. So we, we use this concept of frog eating, but essentially frog, a big old nasty slimy frog is not something that most people find appetizing. And when you're faced with eating a frog, most of the time you're going to want to procrastinate on it and push it off. But it's not going to get more appetizing as the day goes on. So if you have a routine that front loads impact, you making your calls, having conversations with people, front loads that in the day, and you stick to that routine, then the prospecting is going to happen. And all you did was apply something basic. Respect the golden hours, protect the golden hours. You front load prospecting into your day so you can get it over with. You have a routine around that, and then you go about the rest of your day. And as you said, your business skyrocketed. I wish it wasn't that easy. But it really is. It's just that most people won't do that. Most people come in and they're like, they get caught up in the chaos. And then weeks go by, months go by, and they're like, I don't know, nothing's working for me. I don't have any, you know, I don't have anything prospects in my pipeline. But it's the every day, every day, every day, every day. You come in the morning, you chop wood, and then you go about the rest of your day. And if you do that consistently a little bit every day, you're going to win. Because the thing that we have to come to grips with is that the number one reason for failure in real estate sales is an empty pipeline. And the reason why you have an empty pipeline is that you are not prospecting every day. The pipe is life. I got it from your team, which is amazing. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> uh, from Mary. <laughs> you've been, you've been sweet-talking a lot of people on my team. I can tell you're a good salesperson because Mary said, oh, yeah, we sent a big care package. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, um, I, I really love the fact that I think you mentioned it in your book as well. Um, the example with two frogs, like you yeah. eat one frog, but then like, what if you have two frogs? And I think in the book you say um, you, you start with the bigger one, yeah. right? So I think this is amazing. You start with like the worst problem or whatever feels like the most burden right now. Yeah. And, and then after that, you're invincible because everything else becomes easy. And like you said as well, it's, it's simple. It's as simple as that. Like in real estate, we usually say, you know, real estate is simple, but not easy. That's right. So, but it's simple. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, so... I, like I can relate with the definition of sale that you give in se a selling in crisis where you have, you get qualified, you know, prospects in your pipeline and then you move them within your pipeline and then you generate, you know, sale uh, from the pipeline. Yeah. So this really relatable. I mean, this is simple yet most people in New York and real estate, they don't follow it. And also the other thing, maybe we could pick up your brain on this as well. There are, maybe not exactly top producers, but like successful guys in this business. And they've been doing sales and I'm talking about maybe selling, you know, uh, 50 to $100 million, uh, you know, in a year in properties, right? So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. But like, 
at the same time, they never do cold calls. They say uh, it's dreadful. Like yeah. we never do cold calls. You also mentioned that we don't confuse brains with uh, bull market, right? Yes. So, but like, why do you think it's like that where someone is relatively successful? I'm sure they could be 10 times more successful once they know how to call, but like they never do this. Why do you think that's the case with people? Well, if you, if you think about it, right, in some cases, in some cases, you have people who have been in a market long enough that they built mm -hmm. a big enough network that they don't always have to cold call. Like they, they have a network. And I, I, I talk about this a little bit in fanatical prospecting and you have someone new who comes in and they see someone who is successful and, and, but they're not doing any of that. And they go, yeah. oh, well, I'm going to do that too. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not going to work for you. They did that at one point in their life. Like they had to make their market. They didn't just show up and were successful, but they moved to a place in their life where they don't have to do that anymore. And, and I like, I mean, I'll just give you, you know, my, my own story. I've written 15 books. Well, wow. the first book, man, I, I, I filled up the trunk of my car and I went to chamber of commerce meetings and I sold it one book at a time. I showed up and I went, I, I would speak for free for any group that would buy 10 books or more. I, you know, I worked my tail off to sell that book. And then the next book, the next book, the next book. And, and now if I write a book, I've got a big enough fan base that when I write the book, I've already got a certain number of book sales that are baked in. Now that I, I still have to show up and write a good book. Don't get me wrong, but, but I got a fan base that are going to buy the books. I didn't have that then. So I don't go out and fill my trunk up with books anymore and drive from chamber of commerce to right. chamber of commerce and go, anybody who buys a book, I'll give you a speech for free. Uh -huh. People call me and they go, will you come speak at my group? So it looks a lot different than someone who might get started. So I think the same thing happens. The other thing is, and this is important. So there is a, is saying, you know, don't, don't, don't mistake success in a bull market with brains. There've been a lot of people in real estate over the last couple of years that have been phenomenally successful that have no brains. As Warren Buffett says, right, the tide is going to go out and we're going to discover that they've all been swimming naked because you could just be in real estate and the stuff was showing up. I mean, you know, I, I know Manhattan's a little bit different in, in terms of that market because there's really no other market in the world like Manhattan. Maybe Hong Kong, would, uh, maybe Singapore. Like there's a couple of big cities that would be yeah. equivalent to the way the Manhattan market works. But really, New York City is just its own ecosystem. But if, you, if we just go, like, let's just go a little bit, you know, west and go to Westchester. Westchester would act like a normal market. A house gets listed in Westchester in, you know, say last January. It gets listed. 24 hours it sells for 30% more than the listing price because there were 15 bids on it. Okay, yeah. how hard did you have to work as a real estate agent? Not very hard. Like, that was easy. And, yes. and that's been happening for real estate agents everywhere. And the, the New York market, because of the snapback, is probably going to have that happening. You know, you, you have a, an apartment for rent. There's multiple people who want it. So that's going to happen for a while longer. But there's a place, and there's, a, there's always a cycle in every marketplace. So there's been a lot of people who've been successful without having to do anything. My message in, in, in this particular book, this is called Gratuitous Book Marketing, by the way. So, But my message in this book is that you better wake up. Because what was working isn't going to work anymore. We're about to have to get back to real estate sales where we run a process. We run a system. We have to go out and find customers. We might have to go out and knock doors in some neighborhoods to open up opportunities for listings. It's going to be harder because buyers don't have the buying power they had before. When you've got, you know, mortgage interest rates that are above 7%, like I don't remember that in my lifetime and I'm I'm old. Like I'm, you know, I've been around for a long time. I've owned a lot of houses. I I remember 6% when, you know, when I was like in 1992, but I don't remember 7%. That's nuts. So you got a lot of of headwinds right now in the real estate market. So you could show up and be okay if you could fog a mirror. Now you got to be a professional. 
Now you got to have a routine. Yeah. Now you got to respect the golden hours. Now you got to follow the sales process. Now you got to go talk to people. And by the way, even the people who say, well, I don't do that anymore. Those folks, if it gets painful enough because they're not making enough money, they'll start doing it or they'll get out of the business. I, I love that analogy also that like going to basics. And I think when I, when I read your book, uh, you know, the one that you just mentioned, someone in crisis, like my first takeaway was like, you know, when it's a crisis time, turbulence, recession, if people think we're in recession now. Uh, so going to fundamentals, going to basics. And I also noticed that a lot of top realtors, and I'm sure in different other areas, industries is the same. They go to basics sometimes even without the crisis. Like uh, the other day I was reading a book by George Flagg. He's a big real estate, like luxury real estate uh, uh, agent in, in LA. And he door knocks, like in Manhattan, mm -hmm. door knocking doesn't work same way as in other places. Like you mentioned, it's a different yeah. market and we'll have apartments and doormen probably kick you out. <laughs> of the building, but we do cold calls. So uh, this, this guy, George Flagg, he, he does door knocking even without any, you know, crisis looming in front. And he enjoys that. And I think like when you do it well, and when you start enjoying that, you want to go back to that. And then that's like a self-repeating cycle. Yes. You don't need a crisis, right? You don't need this. Uh, you the, know what I mean? Yeah. The, well, the top, the top tier salespeople in every industry practice the basics and fundamentals. They never quit. They didn't yeah. quit during the last couple of years. It's, but there's a lot of people who do and they, you know, they, they quit doing the things that work. And I put up a video the other day ago that, you know, I guess it was two days ago that it's human nature. Like once something starts working, you quit doing it. I don't know why we do that, but we do it all the time. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. so it's the same thing, but then when we get into a, a time of abundance that we've been living through, then not only do we quit doing that, we start believing that somehow or another we're better than we are we start believing that we're the one that's creating all this abundance in our lives. And it's not, it's just yeah. the economy that did that. So then when, when, when the tide goes out, when winter comes, we're sitting there trying to wonder and figure out what happened. So we start trying to find the next app we can download on our phone that somehow are going to make us a genius again, but you're yeah. not going to find it on your phone. You're going to find it in your heart. You're going to yes. have to go out and do the basics. And I love that, you know, you've got this real estate guru who's telling you, I go out and I knock doors. It's just like when, when I'm out with sales teams and I'm teaching and we're running call blocks and I run live call blocks in my trainings, I'll sit down next to a person and I'll make, I'll make dials with them because that's the fundamentals and the basics. You didn't believe this. I, I, people, you talk about the telephone. I had a group of, of reps on Wednesday. We did a 10 minute phone block at 25 reps. We did a 10 minute phone block, 10 minutes, one goal, yeah. 10 minutes, 10 dials, one appointment. We made 240 outbound dials. We spoke to 90 people and we set 40 appointments. In 10 wow. minutes, 25 yeah, people. Great conversion. Great yeah. conversion. Because we just talked to people. They were like, yeah. wow, that's pretty good. I go, you know what? That's pretty good. They went, why? Because you haven't been doing it. Like, you know, it was, I had to come on here and, and make you do this. And they're like, I can't believe how much we did in such a little bit of time. I go, because you're not blocking the time to do it. You don't have a routine. Your day is chaos. Let's, uh, let's flip gears real quickly. And let's talk about um, the, the economic trends. So I make the point in Selling in a Crisis, this is a gratuitous book, uh, book promotion, but I make, I make a point in here that I, I used the quote from Game of Thrones, winter's coming. And we know what comes with it. So in some, in some markets in the country, in real estate, it, there's a blizzard. It's cold. It's the winter, winter has come. And home sales have dropped. Even home builders are beginning to wholesale entire neighborhoods to investors just to have rental houses because they can't sell them to buyers. I, uh, I'm, I'm a, an investor in Timberland, so I buy large tracts of land. And prior to these interest rates going up, if I found a big track, I would just go borrow the money short term so I could make it, I could do a cash deal on that. And then, yes. and then I would give the money back. Well, that's, that's gone now. The, the, uh, the, the real estate or the, the interest rates for like a land purchase now are, are hovering right around 10%. And that's not, that's not sustainable for an investment. There's no, so, so I have to be all cash. 
So now I have to make really careful decisions. I go very, very slow. And I've let a few pieces of property, you know, pass that I like, I just, I don't, I'm not going to, I can't over leverage myself in those situations. What are you seeing right now in terms of trends in real estate? What are you hearing from your colleagues and peers around right. what's happening with this cycle and what you, what do you feel like real estate agents should be aware right. of with selling in these volatile times? Sure. I just want to add that you like Games of Thrones. Uh, I use Batman uh, Dark Knight analogy as well. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a great the storm. The storm is coming, Mr. Wayne. That's right. So whatever people say that means that something yeah. something looming. So while on one hand we have new developments uh, offering you 15, 20% off buyouts, creative financing, like mortgage. Mortgage as of now is around 6.6, .6, yeah. give or take, as of, as of today, right? Uh, but like, they will offer you that, they will buy out two points, so you'll pay like 4% or even less. Um, so people who've been building new developments in New York, they are more than incentivized to sell the apartments, the inventory. We've been working on the Upper East Side building. There's like a brand new development. My company was selling the whole, you know, the whole building. And I don't think they, uh, they might be operating at a loss when you take, you know, project from A to Z, right? So, and then, yeah, I have some clients coming from different parts of the world to the United States to buy an apartment. And every time it's a new development, if you don't go back to them, and it might be an insight as well uh, for your audience, Jeb, and for real estate people and for any salespeople as well. So we'll look at the apartment and then we will let it go. And then the developer would start reaching us out. I mean, not himself directly, but in-house you know, offices. Uh, and if you don't give them an offer, they will ask you to give an offer. And they say, we're not going to be offended if you offer us 15, 17, 20% less, that's fine. Right, so th that's what's going on on the market. Um, resale apartments, uh, inventory is relatively low. So when I do cold calls in the morning, I call expired listings. So someone mm -hmm. say wanted to sell the apartment and now they delisted it because they didn't sell it. So I call them following one of your rules that you actually describe on phonetical perspective, taken cold, uh, taken cold out of the cold call. Uh, so it's not exactly cold call because I know that they've been selling the apartment to no avail, that they failed to sell the apartment. So I call them and I, I, they know that I'm calling about the apartment because I say, oh, your apartment is still on the market. Are you still trying to sell it? So it's not exactly the cold call, right, um, mm -hmm. per se. But um, so a lot of people like that, they are delisting apartments. They're not even selling. So inventory is lower every time. So before I would say September, October, I would probably call to like 25, 20, 25 properties a day. Now it's 50 or more. So every morning, so I barely managed to call anyone, you know, like two hours passed, I made maybe 150 calls and I still have something in my list left. So inventory is lower that actually keeps the prices more or less on the same level. So it's, it's really hard to say. And if you take rental market at least in New York, and if you mentioned timeline from 2010 to now, and if you disregard COVID temporal spikes, you know, like in 2020, you would rent an apartment for like 50% of its price. And then it jumped at the end of 2021. Then it kind of went down again for a little bit. And this summer we reached another record for rental, like median price over 4,200 in New York. Um, so it's a new record. But if you disregard all that from 2010 to 2022, it's uh, increased by 2.5% in rental properties. That's it. So it's, and it's relatively mo modest if you think about it. It's, it. It is growing, but a little bit. So that's the situation with mortgage rates. Now it's 6.6. .6, uh, it's definitely harder to sell. We have more cash buyers and we also have more people, sellers trying to be creative when it comes to financing the property. And also we have more walkaways from, from the contract. So we got four offers in the past couple of weeks on the you know properties that I sell and one walked away. The other three, I'm touching the wood here, have a, a wooden desk. Uh, hopefully it's gonna be good. But uh, yeah, but in New York on average, we have almost 50% walkaways from the contract. That's when the deposit was paid. That's when the contract was signed. Agreement, you know, handshakes, smiles, everything was done. So every second person, every second buyer walks away. That's still, that's basically stats from November. Hopefully it's going to be improving. Well, I think that, but I think that's an important thing to, to take into account. So 
different real estate markets, different places, but that walk away can, can become something that can, that can create negativity. It can, it can impact your mental resilience because one thing that's happening as a market changes is that people will just say, you know what, I'm out. I had this happen to us just uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had a deal we've been working on for three months and it was uh, an international training deal. And we, th we thought the thing was closed. We thought we were done. And we got a call that the company had fired the entire leadership group and was downsizing significantly their global sales force. So what we thought and all the work we had done would just evaporated in that moment. They essentially just walked away because everybody was gone. It's easy to become cynical in those moments and say, well, why would I put all this effort in? I won't do this again. I'll just transact it. Yeah. And I think that for real estate agents, for salespeople everywhere, that you can't allow that to change your behavior. You still have to go in and be excellent because yeah. if you do, then you'll embrace mediocrity and you, you'll, sell, you'll, you'll sell less, you'll have a worse reputation. People won't wanna work with you, but that can be really debilitating, can it? When you've worked on something and, and then the buyer walks away and just leaves a deposit. Definitely. And I think this is number one reason why new agents actually leave this industry, not because they're not talented and not because they couldn't make it, but because in the beginning, you know, there's a lot of failures and it just, the morally, you lose morale, uh, right? And then at some point you start doubting, like one of my new agents, he's, he was asking me, am I too pushy? Should I be less pushy? And, you know, we had to work on the fundamentals because there are different personalities. And, you know, there are people who kick their clients' guts almost literally, and they are so successful in sales. And they're like the nicest people ever. You would think like, wow, he's so soft, but he sells a lot of properties because this is her style. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think Winston Churchill said success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. Yes. So how, do, how not to lose enthusiasm? That's the question. Yep. Well, I think that goes back to what we said earlier, like you've got to invest in yourself, work on your energy. And, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book was to help people hang in there when, uh, when things don't go well, and it's going to be a wild market ride. Uh, yeah. So you're big on TikTok. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I'm, <laughs> as of now, I'm the most followed New York realtor on TikTok. Very good. So tell, <laughs> no, so I, I, I started TikTok in, a month ago. I love your TikToks. I was on them before the podcast as well. And I brought some of my audience. I, I left comments. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, cause I'm, I've got, I've got 422 two followers on, on TikTok. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm big time on TikTok. So tell, tell us, um, tell, yeah. tell people how they can find you like on all the different places where they might want to learn more about you. And there may be some oh. people who, if you're looking to buy or sell or rent real estate in New York city, Alexander's probably someone that you want to hook up with. So uh, talk a little bit about where people can find you on your channel. Yeah. It's basically my first name and last name with underscore in between. So it's Alexander underscore Zacharin. But even if you just type in Alexander Zacharin, it will most likely lead you to some of my accounts. Um, I use Instagram actively. Uh, I use TikTok a lot. TikTok is more about apartments, not only apartments, but there's a lot of apartment doors and Instagram is more about apartments as well, but more about how we work, what we do more intimate. If you want an account where people see everything we do, I was actually uh, showing how we do cold calls. I literally showed recently how we went from cold calling a lady who owns apartment in Inwood, uh, Manhattan, uh, to actually signing a contract on her apartment from A to Z in a couple of months uh, within Instagram stories. So we want to be like, I want to be very transparent and very helpful to agents because when I started, I, I was looking for guidance. I was looking for mentorship. I was getting a lot from your books, Jeff. I was getting a lot from my team leader, you know, uh, Tigran and the, the founder of my company, Itai. So my company, Avenues Real Estate, like they provide amazing training. So if you use that and then add all the knowledge, like all the guidance that, that, you know, you find around, you can make it. So basically, yeah, under my name, I'm everywhere. And we have offices everywhere in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, you pretty much take, you know, uh, the neighborhood, Chelsea, Upper East, Upper West, we're everywhere. 
<laughs> and let me let me spell your last name. So if this is <laughs> it's it's Z A K H A R I N. So Alexander Zakharin, and th- th- that's your handle. People can find you there. And, uh, and if, you, if you've enjoyed this, I mean, the videos are amazing, and you do a great job. And what a pleasure to be able to spend some time with you. One of the things I say on this Thank podcast you. all the time is I love it when I, I have guests on that are not authors or experts or consultants, but they're, you know, they're, they're sales professionals that are in the trenches, in the field, living it and bringing the, breathing it every day, because I think that's where we learn the most. And uh, it's been uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I'm going to give you the last word. What are you going to say to real estate agents, no matter what market you're in, who are watching this or listening to this in the podcast, either the video or the podcast? And what are you going to say to them that they can take away from this, that if they do this right now, they're going to be rolling in dough. I'll tell, I'll say two things. First, there are systems for everything. Nothing new was invented under the sun since ancient Greece or maybe one before. There are systems, how to sell, how to find client, how to fill up your pipeline, you know, Jeb's books, fanatical perspective, that's what I would start with. And then immediately after the next day, selling in crisis. And then there are like systems. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. I believe everybody could be like a millionaire without being genius. You just follow the systems persistently. Uh, and then second thing is that don't sell doubt when you know the market or someone else tells you that you're doing stuff wrong uh, on a personal level. Ne- never take it because in this way, like there is no right or wrong. Someone is nice. Someone is not so nice. Uh, you know, so it's different style, but just find stuff that works for you personally and like execute it and, and you will feel it. Awesome. And <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Zakharin, thank you for joining me on the Sales Gravy podcast. And folks, it. remember, go to learn.salesgravy.com, learn.salesgravy.com. That's Sales Gravy University. If you have never taken a course before, you can take your very first course for free using the coupon code free course. We've got more than a thousand hours of opportunities to learn on Sales Gravy University. Learn.salesgravy.com. Use the coupon code free course. I'll see you next time on the Sales Gravy podcast.